Right, we have now about uh, half an hour for comments and, and questions. And uh, what I would ask you to do is to say who you are and if you're from an organisation, which organisation you're from. And I'll take your comments or questions in batches of three because that will make it a bit more manageable. And we have got a couple of roving mics, so please wait until both I identify you and secondly the mic reaches you uh, again so that you can be heard by those watching online. Um, so, okay. Uh, the lady at the back on the right there, then this lady in the middle here. <laughs> You've got a microphone. Hi. Yes. Um, oh, and sorry. And the next one is right up at the back. You're trying to make the people mics run around a bit, aren't you? So, yeah. front and then the right, far at the back there. Hi, uh, Sarah Lester from the Grantham Institute for Climate Change. Um, I'm doing a piece of work at the moment about uh, social indicators for change, with relation specifically to climate change, but also in the wider social protection area. So my question's uh, well for, for any of the panel, but most specifically for Jen uh, Diffid. Um, uh, can you think of some very specific indicators, maybe, that would, uh, would give me some ideas? I know it's a difficult question. That's <laughs> one of the reasons I'm here today. And if anybody <laughs> has any ideas, please c please grab me afterwards. Um, that interconnect the two things, because I really uh, am struggling to find... S uh, obviously, there are a lot of social protection indicators and ideas about how to do this, but things that specifically connect climate change, development, social protection, women's rights and gender, very broadly, any ideas would be would be fantastic. Thanks. Oh, I hope all the rest of the questions are that simple. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the lady in the, in the front in the middle here. Thank you very much, Alison Evans, Director of ODI. Um, terrific um, presentations and discussions. Uh, discussions. Thanks. Um, until Jen, right end, at the end there, mentioned social policy, I spent my whole time thinking, whatever happened to social policy? Um, and I was thinking, well, you know, is the transformative space here that we're talking about really a kind of return to sort of progressive social policy? And that's really the direction that we want to be traveling in. In which case, you know, my question to Nicola and Rebecca is, you know, how do you see this book contributing possibly to uh, bringing back uh, a, a, a very serious debate about the role of social policy? And I think we're in a very interesting evidence space at the moment in relation to different kinds of social policy instruments, innovations in social policy, including here domestically, that we should be now looking to, to see how much they carry transformatory potential. So the question there is, you know, can we go the next step, in a sense, to start, start reclaiming some of the progressive social policy debate? But my other reflection was a little bit about the discussion of these social protection instruments, because it's my sort of... Um, hunch that we're no longer talking about protection only. We're talking about a whole package of possible outcomes, many of them in the behavioral space actually, which have gone well beyond the remit of where social protection <laughs> started out. Um, and I just wonder where we think that is likely to go in the immediate future. And I suppose it speaks back to my first point, which is, and then how does this begin to create the foundations of a more progressive social policy. I mean, I seem to remember, Jen, it was a certain time in DFID where you couldn't talk about social policy, or at least it went seriously off, off the agenda. And I guess my question is, you know, is it back on? Can it be back on? Thanks. Thank you. And the back there. Hello, I'm Catherine Harbour from BBC Media Action. Thanks for terrific presentations. My question was very similar to the first question about uh, sets of indicators. Um, Anne Maria mentioned ADEPT and I know of uh, gender equitable norms, scales, but I'm curious about the panel's reflections on indicators or sets of indicators for all the variety of work we're talking about. I'm most interested, of course, in media and access to media and voice. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. If I, I, I'll start from, uh, from Jen and then, then work across the panel. And if you can try and address the questions that were very specifically addressed to you. So Jen, you had the very easy one, first mm, of all, about indicators. <laughs> <laughs> um, on indicators, I think we should charge, in fact, actually, if we provide some of these. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer, and I don't think that, I don't think we should force indicators, the, the kind of trite answer is I don't think you should force indicators to try and link everything. I think you measure, you, your indicator, your metric measures what you're trying to measure in terms of a type of outcome, whether that's driven by climate change adaptation program or whether it's driven by a different type of intervention or investment, then that's it. But I don't think necessarily that you can always find the metrics 
that will link all of those. And I think it's about really articulating what is it that what is the change that you're trying to see and capturing that in a measurable, observable indicator is is the key. I think some of the things that are important is about thinking about being able to draw on the different dimensions. So you may be in thinking about indicators that reflect sort of that nexus of economic, social and environmental. So you're looking at different combinations of indicators and also the very real challenge that around the timeframes that you're working in um, and the way that you want to be able to think about adaptation playing out over time or resilience playing out over time. What are the trajectories of that time that you, you're sort of predict, almost predicting and hoping that something will happen and recognising that you know, your, your baseline changes in climate change as well and that you're not sure when it's going to happen and, and at what time either. So they're obviously very real, but I think a lot of it is about thinking not only about the measurability of the metric, but when it's likely to play out and, and how you capture that. Um, so that doesn't answer your question at all, I'm sure, in terms of what you wanted, but um, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> on, um, on social policy and social protection, I, I do agree, I mean, in terms of the instruments, I think that there's, there's sort of, the, the social protection agenda has kind of come in, dif has evolved in different ways, and obviously it's evolved in sort of an instrument way that's then had, had been applied in different ways, and it's also evolved in terms of, so, of sort of policy framework ways, which also then capture different um, dimensions of change. So on the instruments, you're, you're right. I mean, sort of CCTs, <coughs> for example, or conditional cash transfers, are sometimes um, implemented in terms of driving, by incentivizing a behavioural change. Sometimes it's a much wider social assistance um, driver for that. That. And there's, a, you know, there's a, a condition in there, um, but it's not necessarily to incentivise that particular change, which is probably where the Latin America example was coming from, more from the, um, the maternal health in in India um, investments, for example. So I think that that is a very real issue, and what we're dealing with here are a set of instruments that can be applied across a range of sectors. Um, not just what you would call social policy or social sectors, um, and so. It, the way that the, the agenda plays out is one of those cross-cutting agendas that can be applied in for different outcomes. And that's certainly a lot of the thinking that we're doing at the moment as well. Do we sort of imply that a lot of the instruments are across the board, that you'll have outcomes across all of those different areas, or, or whether they are actually particularly... that We should be smarter, I guess, in terms of the, the links between outcomes and, um, and investments and instruments. Um, is social policy back on the agenda? Um, it's a construct that I would use quite broadly in terms of the, if you're looking bro broadly, you look at a country's economic policy, its environmental policy, its social policy, it has different angles there. Do we have a policy paper on social policy? No, we don't have policy papers on many things at, at the moment deliberately. Um, so I think that it, it's, a, it's a discussion that we have, certainly within social development. Um, we, uh, we're very aware that we work across a range of sectors that are social policy um, sectors and that we are interested in social protection as a tool um, within that um, within that context. Uh, but in terms of is it going to be a big headline for that? No, not necessarily. Um, but I think that what's important here is, and something that we've obviously been keen to do all along, is to make sure that this doesn't get boiled down into an instrument discussion and that there's not one solution. So I think, well, how I would use social policy in this context in right now is around thinking about it more than it's it's a much broader sort of social protection framework it's about different instruments that play out in different ways and it's a it's a whole continuum that can go up to sort of legislative change etc um, and different types of investments so not overloading one particular program or instrument or intervention with everything that you're trying to achieve but that you need different interventions that operate in different ways and will play out in over time in different ways um, to really drive that more transformational change and thinking that a public works program alone is going to drive, even if you were measuring over the long term, a substantive transformational change is putting too much emphasis on one particular instrument. Thank you. Uh, Nicola and or Rebecca, if you, you'd like to particularly focus on the question about the re-emergence of social policy. Yeah, I think it's a really important question. Um, I guess for us, one of the the key sort of shifts we've seen in the debate really came with um, actually publication from the bank, so Ariel Fitzbein and Norman Shady's piece when they reviewed all the, the CCT programs and really concluded that CCTs hadn't tapped the question of how you deal with reaching the very poorest, so we're uh, tackling outcomes 
um, that yes, people were getting access to services, but unless you were also tackling, for example, dysfunctional family dynamics, really the very poorest were missing out on mm -hmm. you know, being able to realize those opportunities. So I think that was a big sea shift in recognizing that. And so one of the things that we found fascinating in our research was it wasn't so much the economic strengthening components that seemed to be really making the change in terms of empowerment and agency, it was these complementary interventions. So the informa information provision about other types of programs or awareness raising, behavioral change, communication efforts, et cetera. Um, what's interesting in terms of going back to Jen's point earlier about evidence though, is that we, we know that collectively they're working, but we don't know the relative weight of those different components. And so if we're thinking about value for money, we've got to put money into evaluating, is it the economic strengthening, is it the awareness raising, and if so, do they need to be sequenced in a particular way, or do you have to have a certain baseline before you can really see change? I think sort of also touching on this point about instruments, yes, I don't think we should get, we should only focus on that, but I do think one of the, the things we really wanted to do with our book was to say social protection is not only about CCTs. And so we've got that in one chapter, but we really try to look at the evidence around different instruments. So public works, subsidy programs, <laughs> and then particularly pro-poor insurance for which there is really a dearth of gender-related evidence. So if we're thinking about building up the evidence base, there's a lot more work that needs to be done if we want to think about results and value for money in looking at the gendered effects of these different types of instruments. So we do have to keep that on the agenda still, I think. Do you want to just add anything to that? I'll just add something really quickly. Um, which is around this, and you know, as Nicola and Jen have mentioned, around the sequencing of, of interventions and not focusing on one instrument. And I think in terms of our understanding and knowledge on policy design about where we want to get to in terms of a more transformative <laughs> agenda, you know, we understand that there needs to be a sequencing of activities, of interventions, and that these need to be you know, somewhat tailored to, um, to people's needs as well. But I think one of the critical gaps that we focus on quite a lot in our book as well is around the implementation of that. So that is a, a huge kind of challenge in terms of thinking through what the sequencing we need in policy terms, but then how that is actually implemented in practice. And, and that I think is, is one of the, you know, is still a huge barrier to kind of moving forward in a more progressive way. Thank you. Anna-Marie or Pilar, do you want to add anything? Just a very Can small addition. Make sure you use the mic. Hello. Okay, well Just a very <laughs> small addition to th this question about social policy, which I think is extremely relevant, including in terms of repoliticizing the debates about social policy. And I think there are some contexts in which there are opportunities to do this and to do this from a gender perspective, which, which are those contexts where the international community is playing at state building and where at, the, at that narrative of resettling political settlements and social contracts you can't those are opportunities to think more uh, progressively about um, social policy issues as something that you can embed from the start in in the political process actually just one note on that when i was reading the in the book the example of the guarderias um the child care centers i was thinking are we talking about social protection or social policy mm -hmm. uh but i think it depends on the objective and the lens again that you look at the programs some of them will be social policy broadly some others will be social protection depending on the objectives and a lot of social protection programs have multiple objectives poli social policy and social the issue is that social policy uh, is more difficult to allocate to a certain owner and then, again, here the political economy of who takes care of the social policy becomes a more difficult issue than if you channel social protection, which is actually more charming for a finance minister, too. On indicators, just two notes. It's impossible <laughs> to pick one indicator and say, this is the right indicator. Um, we've tried hard, and you can look at every publication of the bank that tries to summarize indicators. I think that the only kind of caution, caution word that I would give on indicators is that we need to start refraining or moving forward from sex disaggregated beneficiaries. <laughs> I mean, how many children, boys and girls, how many households headed by women, headed by men? I actually think that we've kind of done a disfavor a little bit by focusing on just sex disaggregated indicators. We need to start moving towards measuring 
not only access, but outcomes and also welfare changes. Thank you. Okay, more questions or comments? Yeah, I've got the lady in yellow over there and then the lady second in on the front here and then this lady in the middle at the back there. Hello, I'm Andrea McPherson from HelpAge International. Um, I'm hearing a lot about um, design. I haven't read the book yet. I'm looking forward to reading it. But I wanted to ask um, a question about what does the book tell us about the process um, for considering design and ongoing considerations of design so that civil society, and I'm thinking broadly, broad civil society in countries, um, including academics, media, blah, 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 rather than just civil society organisations as we may traditionally see them. Um, but how, what processes, how important is the process to ensure that reforms are enabled to improve design in an ongoing way in, in, the, trend, in the changing sort of perceptions and understanding of gender, uh, the gender situation, or uh, indeed ageing and uh, other forms of universal difference. Um, and linked to that, I just wanted to, I thought it was really interesting that South Africa example was picked up because in the South African social pension, there's been an equalization of the age of eligibility. And that has come from a strong national discussion around gender equality. And whether we agree with or we don't agree with that manifestation in the reform, I think what's interesting in that example is that a programme like a social pension has enabled a concrete discussion and action to be taken in pursuit of um, gender transformation. At this stage, I mean, it may go further. And that's why I put the emphasis on process. How do we ensure that these social protection programmes, policies, um, have a process of ongoing consultation so they can be reformed and have that, that entry point for um, people with perspectives in those countries to inform the way that they look on the ground and can change over time. I hope that was clear, thanks. Yeah, thank thank you. you. And then it was the lady second in here. Um, hi, my name's Sarah Ricky Smith and I work for BRAC. I had a question mostly for Anna Maria. At the end of your presentation, you said we don't know much about how to economically empower women. And I just wondered uh, about your thoughts on the implications and recommendations for social protection programmes in light of this, particularly asset transfer ones. Thank you. And then there was a lady at the back in the middle here. My name is Charlie Rumsby. I'm an MA student at Goldsmiths. Um, it's a really simple question. Um, in terms of social protection, when is it that, that it s seems fit to actually stop the programme? I know that the bank referred to a 10-year cycle. I'm wondering <coughs> if there's any after work done for people who have been recipients of any of the schemes to then see once the scheme has ended whether or not their um, life has improved over a number of years uh, without any assistance. Okay, thank you. Can I suggest perhaps when the panel are answering that uh, Anna Marie focuses on the economic empowerment question um, and <laughs> well that was specifically addressed to you uh, and the others in the panel to think about both the question about considering design and uh, it, it, the process of consultation and that question about how do you know when, when, when you stop the programme. So I'll start this time from, no, Pilar will pass. Okay, I'll start with Anne-Marie. Okay. Um, yeah, we don't know much. And I think that we want to believe that we know. I mean, we know that women need skills. We know that women need assets. We know that women need uh, have differential access and different barriers. That's what we know. How do we transfer the right assets? How do we transfer the right skills, et cetera? We know less. Um, couple of examples. Um, we've criticized, I mean, and several social protection programs have looked at this, and a big one is skills. There's tons and tons and tons of training programs for women, where women learn normally to become um, seamstresses, hairdressers, um, that's pretty much the scale, teachers, etc. cetera. Um, we know that that works, I mean, gets them an income. And in Uganda, every woman that has gone to a tailoring course ends up getting an income from that training. But what if they were to learn to be, I don't know, mechanics or do any other foundry things? We don't know the outcome of that. I mean. Yet again, I'm going to cite the same example for Uganda. 
we know that those women make more money, but we also know that those women get penalized socially and normatively for doing that. Um, we know that women are segregated in certain sectors of the economy, um, and we try to break that. But at the same time, a program like Estancias in Mexico creates employment opportunities for women by opening local childcare centers. We're reinforcing the care role, but we're providing employment, so is that good? Uh, I think that the question is, social protection is taking action into these areas and all the youth uh, training and employment programs and collocation in Latin America, now the Jordan version and others are working towards that, but we need to build far more evidence and we need to understand exactly what makes a woman make the decision to go for a high pay job, for a more profitable entrepreneurship activity, for a more profitable uh, crop if there are farmers. I mean, what are we know the barriers, but we don't know what are the push factors to get them through the other side. Thank you. Rebecca, do you want to yeah. address the other yeah, question? I'll, um, I'll just pick up on the, um, the one about graduation and, and sustainability. Um, you know, a lot of it depends on, on the objectives of the programme. So across a wide range of social protection interventions, you have short-term programmes, such as public works programmes, which might only be implemented for, for a short period of time to um, to address specific shock or um, and then you know you've got longer term programs such as the asset transfers or conditional cash transfers which aim to have sort of multiple objectives in terms of addressing immediate short-term needs income consumption poverty but then have this kind of intermediate or longer term objective so building people's skills to generate an income or investing in the children's human capital uh, development. So sort of thinking much more long term in terms of breaking into generational um, transmission of poverty. But I think what's, what's important is that I think in general, there's been a very short term approach to social protection programs and mm -hmm. households are expected to graduate out of a program into or out of poverty in three to five years which given the multiple dimensions you know, that we've been talking about, which we highlight <coughs> significantly in the book, you know, the multiple dimensions of poverty and vulnerability which men and women face, it takes more than one intervention and it takes more than three years to graduate out of poverty. But I think there's now becoming more recognition of this, especially as <coughs> programmes are starting, but I don't think have done enough in terms of monitoring sustainability and looking back at households to see wh what their situation is like once the asset transfer has finished or what when you know the, the children go out from the other side of school and so the household is no, no longer receiving that conditional cash transfer. Again, I think it's a huge area of an evidence gap. Very quick. Sure. Uh, just to pick up on the question about the process uh, for involving civil society, uh, we do emphasize this quite a bit in the book. Um, we talk a lot about the importance of ensuring that there's a really robust vulnerability assessment undertaken, um, but we also reflect on why it is that women's groups and movements have not been as active in the area of social protection as they have been in other policy areas. And we think perhaps part of it is to do with the fact that at least historically social protection did have more of a safety net approach. But as the agenda has moved to consider these more transformative issues and, and questions of empowerment, then th this doesn't catch up to be <coughs> done, I think. Um, but I, I guess uh, one of the key things that we highlighted from our work is that um, quotas or simply having a mechanism in place for women is not enough. There needs to be much more in terms of mentoring, uh, regular mentoring, so that women develop the skills so they can participate in these types of processes um, <coughs> with some confidence. You know, particularly if you're thinking about contexts where women might um, have very limited education, maybe illiterate, it's going to take um, quite a lot of um, uh, support in order to really make that participation meaningful. And we've been doing some work on this, as, as Jen mentioned, um, uh, uh, beneficiary involvement in progr uh, participatory programming. And there really is um, a dearth of, uh, of good practice examples, but some important exceptions, which we'll be happy to talk to you about later. Okay, thank you. Um, Fred, we have reached two o'clock, um, and time has run out. And, and I've been given the task within a couple of minutes to try and summarize. I'm not going to, to try and do that. You'll be relieved to know. Um, but, I, but what's come out 
clearly is that uh, th this is a book which is both overdue and timely and a book which will be very useful and very practical, practical for anyone working in the fields of development, social protection and or gender equality. And there's many things that I will take away from it, but, but three particular things I just wanted to mention in wrapping up. One is in terms of monitoring, evaluation and learning, and, and this is something very close to my heart at the moment because womankind have been uh, very much struggling um, to find useful uh, and robust indicators on uh, gender empowerment, and, 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 and that was mentioned, the need for us all to find multifaceted gender empowerment related indicators. Um, the second uh, simple point I'll take away is that um, it's packages of interventions, not simple one-off uh, instruments which make the difference. And the third, which is so, so true, is that life is in reality messy and non-linear. Uh, thank you for that, that Pilar. Um, can I remind you that there is some lunch outside for those of you who are able to stay and that there are books for sale for those of you who uh, have had your appetite whetted. Um, to thank you all for coming and to thank particularly each of the panel for coming and for their contributions. Thank you.